Okay, good evening. My name is Sanjay Cheda. I'm the vice chair of the School of Public Health's uh, Dean's Council, and I also serve as the school's representative on the UW Foundation Board. So welcome to our third PRISM event, and I think you're really going to enjoy tonight's event. Uh, we have a uh, great topic, a uh, very interesting topic uh, about pandemics, when the next pandemic strikes, um, are we ready? And you'll get to hear from three of our faculty researchers, um, all approaching different aspects of tonight's theme. So I think it'll be um, informative and also interactive. And so we've, we've structured uh, the evening in a way where everybody gets to uh, participate and ask questions and be, be part of a discussion on this topic. Uh, I'd uh, like to just share why I'm so passionate about the School of Public Health and the field in general, why, why I think it's so, so interesting and also so important. There's two really distinguishing aspects that I always think about um, when I'm explaining what public health is to, to folks. Public health professionals and, and researchers really look upstream and think about all the things that impact um, the health of our communities and our society. So it, public health includes things like the environment, the impact of uh, chemical toxins and pollutants on our health, access to green spaces and how that helps keep us healthy, um, things like food safety, the, the, food, the, the, the food that we consume, the entire supply chain from um, farms to grocery stores to, to restaurants, how do we ensure that that, that food that we consume is, is safe? Um, things like uh, gun control and how that impacts uh, our health. Uh, and the professionals in this field also think about health at a population level. Um, so not just uh, individuals by individuals that we might need to treat in a medical situation, but how do we think about healthiness of groups, of communities, of entire cities. And, uh, and that's important to me because we're really all in this together. The, the health of the people around us impacts our own health. And the more we can live in communities where everyone is healthy and can lead productive lives, the better we all are. Um, and uh, the better off that we all are. And, and so that, that's what really makes this field so important to me. Uh, we also live in global communities. And, uh, and so the, the environmental decisions made far away in, in India and China and how they produce electricity and uh, what, how much coal they're burning, that impacts our health. That impacts the entire planet's health. And as a segue to tonight's topic, uh, pandemics, well, they can start anywhere in the world and with our very interconnected world where people can be halfway around the world in, in eight hours on a flight, um, they can spread very, very fast. And uh, that's one of the reasons I think that this topic has um, gained so much uh, prominence or, or regained prominence recently. We've had pandemic outbreaks, uh, very, very dramatic uh, diseases um, like Ebola and Zika recently um, that, uh, that spread very quickly uh, around the world. So um, to, to get into uh, tonight's um, uh, plan, uh, we'll have three presenters this evening. They're each going to give you a brief overview of their work. Um, you're going to notice that your name tags are color-coded. And so once the presentations are finished, we're going to break out into smaller groups in adjacent rooms, uh, according to our color coding. And each presenter is going to rotate through and uh, do a 15-minute Q&A and discussion session with the, with the smaller groups. So everybody will get to have um, some uh, quality time with each of our researcher presenters in a smaller group. Uh, so please hold your questions during the presentations. There's note cards at your chairs to write down any questions that you, that have, uh, that you have to, to, to save for your small group. We also have a number of students in the audience tonight, and their name tags uh, designate them as students. Um, so if you haven't had a chance in our opening reception to talk to some of our students, um, please do so whenever you get a chance uh, over the course of the evening. And then after the breakout discussions, we'll reconvene here for coffee and dessert, and that'll conclude the evening. So let me uh, introduce tonight's presenters. Um, I'm very 
pleased and honored to introduce uh, Howie Frumpkin, um, who uh, is my good friend um, and also served as the Dean of the School of Public Health from 2010 to 2016. Um, so I've worked with Howie extensively on our Dean's Council. From 2005 to 2010, Howie held leadership roles at the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC. And tonight, Howie is serving in two capacities. First, to give a brief overview of pandemics and what the UW is uh, planning related to preparedness, and then to discuss his work related to global climate change and human health and pandemics. Our second presenter is Marguerite um, Papianu. I get that? <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> Marguerite is an affiliated professor in the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences, where she contributes to the research, teaching, and outreach programs of the Center for One Health Research. She is an epidemiologist and veterinarian with over 30 years of experience working towards improving global and U.S. public health. And tonight, Marguerite will discuss her work with One Health and its relation to pandemics. And our third speaker is Simon Hay. Um, Simon is a professor of global health and the director of geospatial science at the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, IHME. He leads an international collaboration of researchers with the objective of improving the outputs and outcomes of infectious disease cartography. Basically, it means we're going to see some really cool maps. Um, <laughs> Tonight, uh, Simon will discuss IHME and the use of pandemic predictive modeling. Uh, so without uh, further ado, let's welcome Howie to, to get tonight started. Well, thank you, Sanjay, and good evening, everybody. I'm so glad to see old friends here, and I'm so glad to see uh, new friends, and I see a few not yet new friends, so I hope to see you afterwards at the dessert session. I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of the whole story of pandemics. Uh, the story begins a long time ago. I, I was going to show you an incredible description from the Peloponnesian Wars by Thucydides, but I decided to go farther back than that and show you this passage from the Bible. It, it says, if you just look at the highlighted section at the bottom, the Lord will strike you with wasting disease, with fever and inflammation, with scorching heat and drought, and so on. This is almost a clinically precise description of a pandemic disease, the kind of thing that swept through populations with who knows what kind of regularity, but it, it wasn't unknown to the ancients. It was very well known to the Greeks, and it's been a feature of human history ever since. In recent years, pandemic diseases have broken out across the globe. And this kind of busy picture shows you a couple of things. You'll see that some of the emerging and re-emerging diseases are in red and some are in blue. Some of the diseases that have broken out regionally and globally are long-standing diseases such as anthrax and cholera that re-emerge, sometimes in new unfamiliar forms like the multidrug resistant TB. Others of the diseases that are emerging are brand new, the Mideast Respiratory Syndrome, Zika, things that have only been around for a few decades or even less. HIV might be the best known example. The other thing to take from this map is to look at the density of where these are occurring. And you'll see that we are not immune being in North America. There are lots of uh, outbreaks around the world, but perhaps the densest area that you see there is North America. So this truly is a problem of global proportions. And tackling it is both a matter of global health and a matter of local public health. There's a big literature, so if you like reading science, there are some good books out there to read reflecting the high level of public interest and concern in this issue. And if you like bedwetting terror more than sober science, there's actually a big <laughs> body of fiction as well. The one I want to call to your attention is uh, top row, fourth from the left. Um, I, I just noticed this. It's called Presidential Crisis, Ebola. And you'll notice that the font is larger on Ebola than on presidential crisis. This was a book that was published back when it seemed that Ebola was a bigger threat than presidential crisis. <laughs> well, several things drive pandemics as they break out. One is the way they emerge. The next is the way we detect, or in some cases don't detect them as they emerge. And the next is the way they spread once they've emerged. So what drives the emergence of an infectious disease outbreak? You can see here that the way we live, 
the proximity that we as humans have with, out, with uh, reservoirs of disease, such as animals, has changed. We are an expanding population in geographic terms. We're butting up against animals. The, uh, the livestock and poultry markets of Asia are a good example. The expansion into forests are a good example. So we are up against where the infectious diseases are. Secondly, a whole range of global changes, such as climate change, change the ecology of infectious diseases, and in many cases, intensify our exposure and the probability of the development of these diseases. So that's the question of emergence. Once a disease emerges somewhere, and sometimes we don't even know where, how do we know that it has emerged? How do we detect it? Well, we've got several problems. Fragile health systems around the world don't make it easy. These pictures are a little bit symbolic. The picture on the left is a busy clinical facility, and you can well imagine that the providers, the doctors and nurses working in that facility, have all they can do to keep up with caring for patients. Actually recording patterns of disease, reporting new observations, is often way beyond what they have the capacity to do. On the right, you see a health worker collecting data in a rural setting, writing it down on a piece of paper. That is not the uh, surveillance system that's calculated to provide the most prompt, inaccurate, and complete data. So we often are late to the game when a disease is breaking out. The, uh, the detection is often suboptimal. And finally, the spread. A number of factors contribute to the risk of a spread of disease, and two of them are shown here. The first is a graph showing the proportion of the world's population that is urban. And that blue line that's rising crosses the yellow line in the past decade. The blue line is the urban population, the yellow line is the rural population. We are now a predominantly urban species. We live in close contact with each other in very densely crowded conditions, favoring the spread of diseases. The picture on the right is a picture of one day's airplane flights around the world. And this was from 2012, it, it, about 60,000 flights per day. We're up to about 100,000 flights per day now. So the incredible transmission of people, goods, and in some cases microbes around the world contributes to the spread of diseases as well. So what are we doing about this here at UW? Well, the, the project, it's really more than a project. We're using the term MetaCenter. We are combining six of the different centers at UW that focus on various aspects of pandemic diseases. And the plan is to get us all coordinated in bringing the various skill sets together so that we can tackle this problem. You can see the various centers listed here. Some specialize in infectious diseases. Some specialize in climate change and other global changes. Some specialize in capacity building and training in low and middle income countries. And bringing all these pieces together, we think, is the best way that we can orchestrate UW's contribution uh, to the question of pandemic disease preparedness. What will we do once we get up and running? Well, there are several challenges that we think we have the capacity here to help meet on a global scale. The, challenge, the first challenge is disease-specific approaches. There have been polio campaigns and cholera campaigns uh, and AIDS campaigns but really a systems approach is needed so that we have in place the tools to tackle any pandemic disease uh, when it arises. Secondly, we've tended to be responsive rather than anticipatory, and clearly we need the tools and systems in place so that we can anticipate and be proactive uh, with regard to the emergence of diseases, and when they do arise, detect that promptly and act quickly. The third is the limited lead time, the fact that we often are in the midst of a bad outbreak by the time we realize it. Again, the anticipatory tools will help with that. And last, the fragmented response. The, uh, you've all read stories about the response to uh, calamities such as Zika, where dozens, if not hundreds, of NGOs and foreign governments and others are descending on a place in an uncoordinated fashion. The, the sophisticated systems that we need to coordinate response are very important, and, and that is a, a matter on which we think we can contribute as well. So a wide range of challenges, but a wide range of resources here at the university that we think can help. Well, we're going to move now into the three topics that Sanjay mentioned as potential pieces of this story. The first will be climate change, the second will be the transmission of diseases from animals to humans, and the third will be modeling and forecasting uh, in, in a geographic context. So for the climate change piece, let me introduce Howard Frumkin, who's going to speak to you on climate change. That would be me. 
Uh, you're all familiar with the climate change story, uh, despite the fact that it was evidently a, a Chinese confabulation designed to undermine American industry. We actually have uh, amazingly robust data documenting this phenomenon over recent years. This is the famous picture of rising levels of carbon dioxide, uh, due in large part to uh, fossil fuel combustion. That, in turn, has led to a number of Earth system changes that are shown here. The top picture shows you a global temperature, surface temperature. It's risen by about one degree centigrade over the last century. The middle picture is the global average sea level. Rising sea levels are a function of expanding water as the water gets warmer. The bottom picture is a picture of northern hemisphere snow cover. It's declining as temperatures warm. In addition to these, there are things like more frequent severe storms, drought in some areas, uh, more rain in other areas, a whole system of interrelated, interlocking Earth system changes. And those, in turn, have a lot of implications for human health, which are shown on this incredible animated slide that I've borrowed from the Centers for Disease Control. So you'll see uh, phenomena such as air pollution, severe weather, and extreme heat, all following directly from the geophysical changes that, that uh, characterize climate change. Those, in turn, lead to a whole series of human health threats, ranging from diminished nutrition to severe heat waves. But the ones we want to talk about in the context of tonight's program are infectious diseases. Now, those fall into two major categories. At the bottom of this slide, you'll see diarrheal disease, cholera. These are the so-called water and foodborne diseases that typically affect people through the GI system, causing diarrheal illnesses of various kinds. The other family of infectious diseases, and the one that I'll focus on now, is the so-called vector-borne diseases. And you see those up there at about 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock, malaria, dengue, and so on, spread by vectors such as mosquitoes, ticks, flies, and so on. Now, climate change directly contributes to the spread of these diseases in a number of ways, and they're shown here in kind of a busy slide, but temperature, wind patterns, precipitation, and changes in relative humidity. All of those factors affect the biology of vectors, making, in some cases, the vectors reproduce more rapidly, feed more rapidly, and when a vector's feeding, it's biting you and me, making, in some cases, the life cycles faster so that vector biology moves toward the spread of diseases. Now, this doesn't invariably happen. Some areas actually get drier, and in those areas, the risk of disease can decrease. So we have maps of Africa where we see some areas of increasing risk, some of decreasing risk. These are the direct impacts on the spread of disease. Climate change also operates through indirect pathways, as you can see here. Desertification and drought is that first blue disk on the top. Changes in vegetation, hydrologic changes, and so on. So for example, if a river hydrology changes and the river bank ecology changes, that can change the habitat, and it can promote the growth of such vectors as tsetse flies, which can then enhance the spread of trypanosomiasis, Chagas disease, and affect more people. So many indirect ways in which climate change working through the ecosystem and through uh, weather patterns can promote the spread of disease. Let me give you three quick examples. Dengue fever is a disease that is endemic in the Americas. The forecasts that climate modelers gave us beginning several decades ago were that dengue would spread as climate change progressed. What you see on the top is maps over three successive decades of the countries of the Americas in which dengue is endemic. And what this doesn't show is that we now have cases, endemic cases in the U.S. in Florida, Texas, and Hawaii. It's a, a new observation over just the last few years. Malaria is uh, perhaps the vector-borne disease to which most people in the world are exposed. Very complicated disease dynamics. Uh, many of the influencers of malaria are outside the climate change world, but climate change certainly changes malaria risk factors. This is a simple cartoon. It doesn't begin to do justice to the complexity of the story, but it does connote that in places where the weather's warmer, then malaria can expand its range, and that includes not only farther from the equator, but it also means moving up mountains. So we're seeing malaria now at elevations where it hasn't been seen before. The good news is that in some places, as rainfall drops, malaria risk is expected to decrease. The third and final example is Lyme disease. This is a tick-borne disease, and this is one that we're familiar with in this country. What you'll see here is modeling and predictions of the spread of Lyme disease. It began in a small area off the Long Island Sound, 
It has been spreading over time since then. It's up in the Midwest now and down in the South. And you can see over coming decades, the modeling predicts that it will expand considerably. It'll be one of our gifts to Canada, as you can see by about uh, 2050. And interestingly, some areas such as Florida that are currently at risk will see diminished risk as various features of climate change proceed. So a complicated story and one that requires a lot of complicated analysis. How we use climate science in public health is pictorially represented here. We look at some of the climate models and projections that are made. This is a picture of the globe, which is divided into geographic segments. Then weather forecasts are made for each segment based on meteorologic data and other data. Then those are combined with health data. What you see here is timelines showing temperatures and various diarrheal diseases, in this case in Canada. So we know something about the pattern of disease responsiveness to meteorologic factors. We forecast some of those meteorologic factors, put it together, and generate useful public health information, such as this disease may be likely to break out in this location in 20 or 30 years at the rate climate change is progressing. Let's be sure to build capacity in the laboratories for diagnosing it. Let's be sure to ramp up a surveillance system, and so on. So this is, in, in very quick review, the way we take climate science, merge it with public health approaches, and uh, set out to protect the public. So that's the climate change story. I'm going to turn the microphone over to Marguerite now, who will talk about animals. Good evening. Um, I'm going to put in a slight statement, actually, before this presentation in that although we're going to look uh, quite closely at many infections that move from animals to people, to remember that animals are good for us and for our lives. And I often, as a veterinarian, I, I often feel compelled to say that because at the end of talking about a lot of these risks and infection risks, uh, sometimes people can forget that. So. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to revisit um, this just a, a different way of uh, 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 graphically showing some of the many infections that Howie presented in his map of emerging infections that, uh, that have occurred over time. These diseases, diseases that are spread to people from animals, they're, they are uh, any disease or infection that is transmitted naturally from animals to people is referred to as a zoonotic disease. It comes from the Greek, from Greek words, um, zoonosis, and zoonotic disease. And over the last 10, 20 years, we've had many outbreaks of these emerging diseases, some of which have, have spread pr quite quickly around the world and um, have been of, of important concern. They cause human illness and death. Um, they uh, lead to fear. Um, they are threats. Uh, several of these can, in the right circumstances and conditions, spread rapidly and become pandemic. And they also can lead to uh, economic um, uh, distress, both at household and at national budget levels. These pathogens are spread through a number of different routes, uh, through food and water, as Howie mentioned, through uh, the ecology, through our, uh, as we live in our natural environment, but also environments that we create, such as live bird markets, um, occupational exposures, uh, animal health care workers um, uh, can acquire these diseases. Uh, in the far lower right, uh, recreational and uh, our contact and our interaction with animals, with pets. Uh, and our companion animals. In the bottom center, medical routes. Uh, we can acquire them uh, uh, through several different uh, uh, routes there. And, uh, and then, of course, bioterrorism, the intentional spread we, uh, we worry about. From here and through this understanding of the connection between human and animal health, but as it occurs in the environment, a term was born in, uh, in the early 2000s of One Health. And One Health really is about, it's one definition of it, is the collaboration among multiple disciplines working lo locally, nationally, and internationally 
to attain optimal health for people, animals, and our environment with the notion that if any one of the triad is too unhealthy, it will definitely impact the health of the other. So we're all in this together, is how we said. I'm going to take us through a very quick example of how quickly some of these diseases can spread. This was uh, really, a, uh, sadly, a poster child of, of really a circumstance that really uh, uh, quickly spread around the world. I'm not going to show this in the order in which it happened because it actually began, we picked it up, it was detected in people first, and then we traveled back in time over the course of the outbreak to discern where it came from. But so now, after the fact, we now know that the severe acute respiratory syndrome, or SARS, actually resides, it's a reservoir, it's in horseshoe bats. And that bats had infected civet cats, although they're not cats, but they're, they're called that. Uh, and, uh, and those were then in live bird markets, or excuse me, live animal markets, that then were visited by people in, um, in the Chinese and the lower uh, uh, Chinese area, Guangdong province. And probably the first, this is where the first human cases were thought to have occurred from uh, their interaction with uh, civic cats in the live animal markets. An ill gentleman, uh, and a gentleman who became ill with SARS in China traveled to Hong Kong uh, in uh, 2003 and, and uh, he stayed one night, um, February 21st to the 22nd. And at that same night that he stayed in that hotel, there were several other guests who, stayed, who were on the hotel on his floor, uh, neighboring the floor below. And as you can see here, they stayed uh, in the hotel. They actually became symptomatic with illness by those white crosses that are shown on the far right. So they uh, actually left the hotel. They returned home. And they returned home to several different countries. And so as they returned home, and in this graphic, the Hotel M, that's the hotel where they all stayed, is in the middle. And these uh, countries in which they returned to, Canada, Ireland, the United States, Germany, et cetera, all the way around. And then they ended up going to hospitals to be treated. And they infected healthcare workers. And then the healthcare workers returned to their communities and infected other people in their communities, all while everybody was trying to figure out what was causing this, what the agent was, and how it was being transmitted. Of course, now we know how it happened. But really, in a very short period of time, this led to illness in 29 countries, 8,000 cases, and uh, 700 deaths. Luckily, uh, with the knowledge of how it was transmitted and, and it subsided, and it did not uh, continue over ongoing years. So if you were to step back and look at this rather than a single disease, but more from a conceptual uh, overview, uh, the far right is generally where surveillance, for the most part, up until the last 20 years, used to focus almost alone. And this was detecting disease, uh, treating disease, uh, in human populations, and then uh, going back and finding out that many of them uh, were uh, the source of infection were animals. But if you, look, if you then look at more chronologically what happens, and if you look at uh, how we spoke uh, quite well about the drivers, but then this leads to emergence in animal populations, which are represented in blue the same way that humans, there's exposure and treatment, and then uh, uh, humans are infected from their contact with animals, that this then is really, uh, we have lots of opportunity. If we can get to early detection and even pick it up in animal populations, potentially even to stop pandemics from occurring at all. And those little squares on the bottom are actual interventions that we can do with disease prevention and control. Um, to stop, and in the question and answer period in the breakout sessions, we can talk about that some more. These are two examples of actual, then, integrated surveillance systems. Uh, the far left is Arbonet, and uh, West Nile virus is being tracked in mosquitoes, birds, horses, 
and uh, humans. Um, and this is an ongoing surveillance system uh, used by local, state, and uh, the country uh, health departments today. Over to your right is the National Antimicrobial Monitoring System, or NARMS. This is looking at antimicrobial resistance in uh, retail foods, in animals that slaughter, and uh, human uh, illness cases. So all of this has led to a desire of can we do better to detect earlier, but even can we predict where these diseases could emerge uh, so that we have a running start at hopefully preventing them, but absolutely minimizing their health impact. Um, some of the earlier attempts that have uh, started with this, uh, that have been begun, is looking at hot spots. There's uh, several groups that have looked, this is just one example, that are looking at hot spots of where these are, uh, diseases are likely to emerge, given the drivers, human population, other factors. And then on the far right, influenza is one of those uh, 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 infectious diseases that is always worrisome that it could go pandemic. And so since the source of many of those viruses are in wild birds, uh, people have actually tracked the flyways on which birds fly. Again, this is getting at what data do we need to actually predict where these diseases uh, uh, will, will go to and, and break out. The Center for One Health Research at the University of Washington is uh, focusing on these efforts. and. Uh, there are definitely uh, uh, real efforts at tracking and controlling uh, emerging infectious disease threats, uh, really building collaborations and strengthening collaborations to address zoonotic diseases, and training the One Health workforce. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Simon Hayes, who's going to then follow on with the story and uh, modeling, and uh, again, trying to get to a more of a predictive uh, uh, circumstance. So, Simon? Thank you and good evening. We're going to talk uh, a little bit more, and I've been set up in a, a wonderful way here, but you've got the background and you know, now know some of the, the terms like zoonosis and whatever, so I'm going to expect all of that prior knowledge. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll recap that just, uh, just quickly. So, when we want to predict or be more prepared for a disease in the future, we need to break down what the parts of that are that allow it to go from this outbreak in the reservoir host, this the animals, the One Health part that we've just talked about, into this index human case. This is the one, this one overspill event, which people spend an awful lot of time working out the probability of that, and we'll talk a little bit about that in some of the maps that come forward. We're also very interested in the probability of that index case then turning into a local outbreak. So in the SARS epidemic, this would be that person in the hotel, how many people they went on to infect. And we, I'm going to number these one, two, three, and four, and then we're going to talk to modeling each one of those processes in the next few slides. So number three is then once you have the probability of um, the local outbreak occurring or the hospital-based um, spread of this disease, what is the chance of that then sparking a national or much wider level outbreak? And of course, many of the things that we're interested in and Time Magazine and all of these um, books are interested in that you will have um, seen in Howie's talks are worried about this bit. How, uh, once you get on an aeroplane, how many parts of the world can you infect and you know, at what risk will we be? Uh, in, the, in, in the more developed world. So we'll have a look at each, each part of that spectrum. So what you have here is a map of Ebola index cases. So these are that, that point one. So this is where it's come out from the animal reservoir. I don't have time to talk about um, all the different parts of that, but it's mostly bat species that it, that it hides away in. And you will see that those are the reservoir uh, sorry, index cases in humans in red, and in the blue is where we found it in the animal populations. So that is the sum total of information that we have on index cases of uh, Ebola virus disease. And the first one, 
this one was in 1976 by the Ebola River, um, uh, hence, the, hence the name of the disease, and discovered by Peter Piot, a big uh, friend of uh, the University of Washington. One other thing I'd like to print out for, point out from this map is that the countries that have a, a dark outline here are the ones that have actually had an index case. So they have had an experience of having Ebola virus disease within their borders. When I show you the next bit, all of those other countries have risk. So I don't have time to go into how we'll make those risk maps for Ebola virus disease, but maybe we can talk about that in the, in the 15 minutes um, that we get afterwards. But once we have those locations, and this is the, the bit of work that we do and we would add to the Meta Center, is we can now then predict from that very limited suite of information, if we know about where all the bats are and where the forests are and where the rivers are and where the humans are, what's the relative risk of a, an outbreak that stage one of it going from the animal reservoir population into humans. And that's what we show here. And the point to take home of this is that there are six countries that have had index cases and experience of these Ebola virus diseases, yet there are actually 19 countries there that have very significant um, animal reservoirs that currently have no uh, plan whatsoever, no preparedness plan at all about how to deal with this disease should it outbreak. So what we've now, now done is to create a suite of very, very simple tools, and I, can talk, I haven't got time to talk about all the modeling that goes to generate each one of these maps. The unit of information here is the first, or in some cases, second administrative district within a country. And the reason that we target on that, rather than the pixel level that you saw before, is this is the unit of information at which public health policy is usually implemented in those locations. And again, the index here is just from low to high. So this takes all of, for, across all of the countries and all of the administrative units across those 19, which ones we should be most worried about index cases occurring. So if you wanted to prioritize your surveillance, you would definitely be going to the purple areas and not the, um, the green ones at the bottom. But you wouldn't really want to miss those either because they have substantial uh, or they have a, a, a finite risk of those things, um, of those index cases occurring. So that's that stage one, if you remember back to our original diagram. Stage two is once you've got that index case, what's the probability of that spreading? And you might think that there are, you could sort of hypothesize about what that would be. So it's more likely to spread if you're uh, a don't have many hospitals, you have a low number of physicians per capita, you're in high density populations, um, et cetera, et cetera. And again, don't have time to talk about how all of that goes in, but we collect it, all of that information at all of these administrative levels and then reapply that risk. And this is the risk of an index case then turning into a local outbreak. So getting to that next stage of the, on the progression to the pandemic. Then you can do some really fancy modeling, which takes into account where all the population are and how they're connected through road networks and transport networks within a country and say, what's the probability once you have a local outbreak in any one location of that seeding a much wider outbreak within the country? And you can stratify uh, those according to that. There's a, an awful lot of work that goes into underlying this. And then you can go to those countries and say, um, which is what we have done, and you can talk to them and say, in the first instance, do you have a pandemic pre preparedness plan? Do you know about if it's going to break out in a particular region, which part of your country is more um, at risk than not? And the final bit that, we, that I haven't shown you here because it, we're still working on it is that bit, that number four, um, how connected are those particular countries and those administrative regions um, to the rest of the world? So how, how worried um, are we that those will spread from outside of Africa or between Africa? And you might think that that's a very parochial thing that is you know, only of interest to us, 
But my main concern when the Ebola epidemic was happening was not the, and the slide from Howie was very informative on that of where all the um, air transport goes. The biggest growth sector in that is actually south-south connections. So my biggest worry wasn't the fact that we would import cases into Heathrow or um, Dulles or um, areas that we might be worried about because we're um, very, uh, we have very good healthcare systems that will, will probably mop that up quite quickly. But I was very worried about if they went into another part of Africa, another part of South America, or particularly India and some of those populous countries that may well have got overwhelmed. So in summary, that's the kind of work we're doing to try and increase in what I call epidemiological peacetime, i.e. when we're not in the midst of an emergency, mm. how we can um, try and prepare and talk to people about uh, what the risks are and how they vary within their countries. And this workshop here um, represents all um, Ministry of Health officials from all of those 19 countries that had risks. So not only were we able to show them the maps, give them those tools, enable them to see those visualizations, but they could also talk to each other um, and set up that network so that if you had experience in index cases in DRC, that person in DRC could talk to the person in Guinea. And do remember that the, while we had the big breakdown in West Africa, there was also another index case in DRC which was controlled in the same time. And I think the difference in there is largely experience. And again, this kind of networking and being able to bring these groups together is a really important part of that. And I think that's it. <laughs>